So uh, I'd love to start out talking, if we can go all the way back to the G4 cube. If, uh, I don't know if anybody in here remembers this, but it was a sort of a, a cubular G4 <laughs> desktop. And, I think that's uh, exactly what we called it, yeah. At, at the time, that was sort of slimming down a big beast of a machine. Uh, are there mm -hmm. applicable skills uh, to designing modern wearable technologies that maybe you learned on the G4 experience? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great question because really, you know, there's this uh, ongoing trend, right? Computers started out filling whole rooms or even whole buildings, and then they're, you know, rooms, and then sitting on your desktop, and then, um, or in a closet, and then finally, you know, on your desktop. And uh, the G4 Cube was actually somewhat unique in that it was one of the first uh, fanless computers, uh, which got a lot of... Steve hated fans. He did hate fans, and he was pretty consistent in that from, uh, from uh, the years I worked at Apple. Um, and, and absolutely, there's a lot of things, I think, about the G4 Cube that were... Uh, uh, you know, from a commercial success perspective, you know, it, it did okay, but I think really it sort of pointed the way to some things that Apple um, and a lot of companies have sort of held true, which is you want to make something really beautiful. Um, you want to make something that fits into their, their life in an uh, in obtrusive way. You know, it sits on, it sits on your desk in a nice, and is an elegant thing and a, a piece of art as much as it is, a, a, you know, a functional piece of technology. So, you know, it's one of the, I think it's the only computer that's in the, the uh, Modern Art Museum. Uh, it makes sense. I mean, I've worked on the internals of it, and it's like pulling out the reactor core in some sci-fi movie. This little handle comes out, and you slide it out of the case. Yeah, it yeah, was the inspiration, for sure. It was, uh, you know, all those James Bond movies. Excellent. Uh, if we can move up in your career a little bit more, the Palm Pre was actually, in its day, a terrifically innovative device that mm -hmm. just sort of suffered from the, the difficulties of the market in the smartphone world at that time. But are there uh, design decisions that you made in the pre days that maybe are continuing to, that you think were best practices, good decisions that maybe haven't even been meted out or just now being decided on in other phones? Uh, you know, I think, um, I mean, we actually, I think we're still seeing some people playing with some of the things that we explored with the pre. Uh, there's some uh, there's some real nice UI work done on the pre, which I, I think has actually been adopted by other uh, phone manufacturers. So it's always nice to see those things kind of carry on, you know. Um, and and it's also I think the pre is a great example of how timing really matters in this industry. Mm -hmm. you know, a, a few months too early or too late can make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then moving on to the Nike uh, era, I mean, this is a complete departure from the previous stuff you were doing where there was a direct user interface or, you know, the Nike Plus fuel band is basically just sort of a, 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 a sensor, basically. I mean, it has a little mm -hmm. bit of interactivity, right? But how is it different designing for something that has much, much reduced feedback for the user? You know, I, um, from a, a user interface and an industrial design perspective, I think actually it puts more pressure on you because, you know, with the fuel band, I'm wearing mine now, of course, um, you know, you need to do a lot with one button in this case. You need to do your Bluetooth syncing and you need to, you know, give the information that people need. Um, and so I think it actually, in some ways, is a more demanding user interface challenge than having a screen, although the screen can be a pretty terrible temptation to start throwing lots of things on it and that can also be uh, detrimental to the, to the end user experience. Um, I think the interesting thing to me is when, when I started working at, at Nike was just how, uh, you know, how the demands of the cellular phone industry, which I thought were pretty high, you know, you had to be able to drop it on concrete, you had to be able to, um, you know, put it in a uh, dryer and tumble it for a while, you know, there's a bunch of things that I thought were pretty uh, challenging compared to the computer world where I had, had been previously. Um, then if you kind of move to, to wearables, the way people treat their wearables and their watches is, is even more demanding, you know. I, I remember at Nike, we had our first fuel band prototypes, people were wearing them, and somebody said, oh yeah, I dropped a kettlebell on it and it stopped working, <laughs> you know, which is this 50 pound weight that they, they crushed their fuel band with. So, um, I mean, I think that is one of the things and we are seeing uh, and have seen in the market uh, some people struggling with just the demands of putting things on people's body in terms of moisture ingress and, the, um, you know, the environment that it's in and different kinds of chemicals it gets treated with and uh, how it gets uh, accidentally left on in the wash or whatever, you know. So I, I think we're, we're seeing people learning now in the tech industry some of the things that a lot of people in the watch industry, for instance, have, have known for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're also wearing the, uh, I call them the electric shoes beforehand. Yeah, that's right. That's a very uh, flattering description of them. Uh, yeah, and so these were, uh, you know, another interesting project that we did at Nike. They're the Nike Plus training bas and Nike Plus basketball shoes, which actually have sensors built into them, sensor pads, and can actually 
uh, determine whether you're, where, you know, what your stance is, whether you're on your toes or on your heels, uh, you know, measures your, how high you jump and, you know, how quickly you're moving. Uh, which I thought was, a, you know, it uses Bluetooth LE. It's one of the first um, uses of multiple Bluetooth LE sensors talking simultaneously and coordinating uh, to your phone. Um, but, you know, very innovative product, you know, one where I think um, a lot of people have never even heard of it. So how do you approach designing a user interface for a shoe? Uh, again, challenging. Uh, I mean, the good news is that the shoes are really, in this case, are really the sensors, right? So the... The, the trick is to give it, make it easy for people to, you know, to get the batteries uh, installed and to understand how to connect them to the, you know, to your phone. But, but you know, a, a lot of it is around keeping it simple. Mm. Trying, you know, there's no flashing LEDs. You know, if you hadn't said anything, most people would probably not have even thought that they were connected. Mm -hmm. Uh, so at Intel, you guys are obviously experimenting and doing all sorts of fun things based mm -hmm. on your past experiences. Uh, what are some of the wacky things you guys are working on? What, what's the strangest thing you've plugged into the internet? Uh, well, uh, I think one of my favorites is one of my engineers thought it would be interesting to kind of understand what his cat was telling him. So he actually wrote an algorithm that translates his cat's meows into, into messages. So whether it wants to go outside or it's hungry or it's upset. So, um, you know, once you, uh, you know, once you can start to be able to connect these things to the internet, then you can start to, to log them and you, you get a much richer view of, of everything from your pets to your, to your family to your home. Uh, but now we're even talking, uh, continuing on the user interface for weird things. Now we've got a user interface for a cat. So how do you <laughs> even design that? Uh, a great question, actually. I think there's been a, there's been a number of people interested in that, uh, the wearable for pets. Mm -hmm. I, mean, that's, I think I've probably talked to a half a dozen startups playing in that space myself. Um, I guess the question is, is it a user interface for the cat or is it a user interface for you? And, you know, is that, uh, you know, where's that crossover? But I think, um, I, you know, I think when you look at the user interface design, you know, there's a, um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in the wearable space, um, particularly because I think there's just some conceits about what, what is a smartwatch? You know, is it a, really a, a smartphone on your wrist? You know, is it, should it be a purpose-built device? Uh, and I think we're seeing the whole spectrum of those built, um, some with more success than others. Uh, you know, at Intel, we're, we're working with a number of different partners to, to build what I think are, you know, very interesting products, and they are really coming from very different perspectives. So there's the Basis Watch, which really is uh, around health and fitness and, and wellness, and tracking your sleep and tracking your movements and trying to understand, classify the activities that you're doing, and then give you recommendations on how to... Uh, you know, how to uh, improve your, your health. And that one is interesting because um, it, there is the on-watch experience, and it does give you some information, but a lot of it is around the way that information is then uploaded to the cloud and processed and then reflected back to you through your, uh, you know, mobile application that, that gives you recommendations and helps you pick what things you're going to work on next. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, uh, Mika, which is a, a collaboration we did with Opening Ceremony, was really a fashion first product. And so we really tried to make it something that was beautiful and that people would be delighted to wear and then inserted the technology into it. So it wasn't trying to wrap um, fashion around something that was you know, purely a technical uh, object. Mm. And, uh, and in that case, we really tried to keep again to a very simple directed use case, which is around communicating and communicating with friends. Um, but it's, it, it doesn't have any kind of, well, it has a phone application, but it, most of the time it's really its own independent device on a 3G network because of the, the use cases. Um, and so, you know, we're really trying to think through what are people trying to get out of the wearable device and, and how do you actually use the, the full suite of technologies that are available, whether it's on the device, on the phone, you know, on their computer, on their, you know, on the, uh, the server to give them the, the best possible experience. Mm -hmm. And how do you determine uh, what the users want? Do you have sort of a, a, a rule of thumb for determining what would be a good wearable application? Um, you know, the good news is that we uh, have really taken an approach of partnering with companies that are uh, established brands that really know their consumer. So it gives us a head start for sure. Um, you know, opening ceremony, um, Fossil, uh, Oakley. I mean, these are brands that have been putting technology, although maybe not necessarily connected smart technology on people for, for uh, decades. And they have a very good sense of who their consumer is and what, it is, what are the problems that that person faces. So we work with them. 
Um, and then we, you know, we take very seriously um, the research that we do and the, you know, the things that we hear back from the consumers as well as the partners we have. Mm -hmm. well, you had said you had a specific rule of thumb about uh, superpowers, was it? Oh yeah, well I, I do, you know, I think that there's, uh, there are the smart watches and, you know, and the fuel bands, and I think there are very interesting products, but I, you know, as I think about um, kind of the next generation of wearables, uh, one of the things I think about is what is the, what is the superpower this gives you? you know? Is it the ability to always know where you need to be? Is it you know, infrared vision so you can see in the dark? You know, what, is, what are the other things that this thing can do for you that really extends your capabilities as a person? Mm -hmm. um, and I think it can be mundane, like talking to your cat. Um, or they can uh, really be life-changing, like um, you know, artificial hand, which is the, the work that um, Open Bionics did uh, with Edison on the Make It Wearables Challenge. Mm -hmm. Uh, why don't we talk about Edison then? Uh, why don't you tell everybody what Edison is? Yeah, so I've, uh, hopefully some people at least know uh, about Edison. Edison is a, uh, it is a small um, stamp-sized computer that Intel has uh, produced. It's a dual-core computer with a sensor hub. It has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth connectivity. And it's really intended as a platform for companies to build um, IoT and wearable devices uh, very easily. And uh, Edison is, um, was, was most recently uh, featured in the Make It Wearables Challenge. Uh, when it came out, we actually introduced a number of products, or actually I should say we had a number of people submit ideas for products and then actually prototype them uh, based on Edison. And some of them were, I think, really uh, whimsical. I mean, the, the, the winner of the contest was actually a company called Nixie that made a... Uh, flying camera. Yes, a flying camera, exactly. It was a, a wrist-worn uh, camera that you would take off and then you would let it go up in the air and you could take uh, the ultimate selfie. <laughs> um, but some of the other ones were really interesting to me because I think they also point to the, the real diversity of wearable products, right? I think everyone's sort of hung up on smart glasses and, and smart watches. But for the most part, uh, in the Make It Wearables contest, their, their winners really were covering a really broad swath of capabilities. Um, there is a, a company that did, I mentioned a little bit earlier, a uh, hand for amputees, uh, or people who, who need them, prosthetics. Um, there was somebody who did a, um, a glove that was actually used in an industrial setting for detecting, you know, you could use it to detect uh, temperature or to measure force or uh, even send instructions to a, um, a manufacturer, you know, a worker on the manufacturing line. So a, a, a tremendous range of products that I think you know, as, as wearables start to become more mature and as I think more people get involved in the conversation, I think we'll see a real profusion of them you know, focused on specific tasks and solving real, real world problems. And you guys are really focused with Edison on, on speeding that process of innovation for these companies, right? Yeah, I mean, the real intent is to, um, to let people essentially open the box and go from their concept to something that they can actually start testing very quickly. And, uh, Edison, you know, it, it's got the hardware, but it also has the software piece to it. And there's even some cloud services that we provide um, so people can test out the, the, the full end-to-end -end value chain for the product. And I think one of the, we also have an ecosystem of people making add-on boards that allow you to uh, bolt a bunch of things together and make something very quickly from, from these basic components. So the, the spider dress, which we showed off at CES, we actually had a prototype running of all the, the hardware in an afternoon because we just took the Edison and we took some of the, the SparkFun uh, expansion boards and we put them together and we were able to start driving all the servos. Because mm -hmm. you can plug Arduino shields into it, right? That's right. Actually, uh, Edison has an Arduino uh, a board that you can plug it into and then start using the shields. Um, it also uh, has its own expansion board breakout board that you can use and it runs uh, Arduino sketches. Excellent. And. Uh, 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 what's the future of this? Are you planning on offering more boards, more variations? What mm -hmm. sorts of stuff coming out? Yeah, I, I think um, uh, I don't want to tip our hand too much, but actually we, we continue to really update the platform. Um, just recently, we added a bunch of BTLE um, uh, capabilities. We are looking at you know, uh, Wi-Fi Direct, and so that's actually now part of that platform. So we continue to expand on it. And in fact, I think we showed off some other things at CES, like. Uh, running uh, automatic speech recognition on Edison. We've been doing some things around computer vision, and the intent is to make those available to, to people who have an idea and they want to try and build it. Oh, and another big aspect of it is because you are such an international company, you can help people source the parts that are off of here when they're going to production, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, 
the good news is that there's actually companies who take Edison and they say, you know, this solves a significant problem for me, and now they're taking that, not just prototyping on it, but then bringing it to market. So we'll see products this year that actually have Edison as the, the brain inside. Excellent. Uh, if we can shift gears a little, I want to go back to some more of the holistic stuff that you've learned as a, uh, in your career. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, at Nike, uh, prior to your joining Nike, it wasn't necessarily a completely tech-focused company. Obviously, there was a lot of tech. Uh, mm -hmm. What's it like sh sort of spearheading a team that's now like in software in a company that makes textiles and fabrics and shoes and clothes? And yeah, um, you know, it's, so in Nike, I mean, I think the, the, the good news is Nike really does have, you know, they... they we're one of the first companies that really embraced social media. They, you know, they they um, they have technology that's maybe different than what you and I might consider it. But I mean, if you look at the things that they do around polymers and shoe construction and things, I mean, they do understand how technology can really change the world and change their products. Um, uh, you know, there's a little bit of an impedance mismatch between the the uh, engineers coming from the Silicon Valley and the uh, innovators in the footwear world. Um, but, uh, but for the most part, I think it, 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 was, uh, it was good. I have to say I am really glad to be back among my, you know, the, 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 my comfort zone with you know, the folks at, uh, at Intel. Certainly. For, for some of the people in the audience who might be in a company where they're trying to spearhead a project like this, is there any advice when you're dealing with product life cycles that are on you know, a clothing or mm -hmm. a, a consumer products like in Macy's? sort of time frame versus the software development life cycle, which is just this ongoing march that sort of, you know, is just keeps going and there's yes, never, you're never done. Never ends, no. Um, well, I mean, I do think that, um, you know, Nike has a very specific cadence and most of the companies, you know, that are in that space have a very specific cadence of how they do things. Mm -hmm. Some of it lines up really well with the things that we do in the consumer electronics space. Um, you know, some of it may, may be less so. Uh, but I think in, in the end, you know, there's more commonalities than there are differences. Mm -hmm. uh, I do think that, you know, we, we don't generally have like a fashion season or a fall season for, uh, for electronics. Or, uh, we do have CES. The, the spring. I guess we have CES and, and Christmas and, and dads and grads. So maybe we do have those seasons. But they're not based on what color palette you're, you're interested in. Certainly so, not. And, and they have to refresh every year. Those things, I mean, the clothes have to be completely refreshed every year because of fashion, whereas maybe mm -hmm. in a software development light cycle, it's an incremental evolutionary process. Yeah, although, I don't know, I'm guessing there's not too many people in the audience here who have phones more than a couple years old. So no, that's a good point. We have a pretty good refresh cycle uh, uh, on, uh, on consumer electronics as well. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, I, I, th I do think it's, it's great. I mean, one of the things that we did as Intel was uh, when we decided we're going to build, uh, you know, fashion that has wearable technology in it as opposed to wearables that are fashionable. You know, we spent a lot of time talking to the CFDA and the fashion industry and meeting with designers and meeting with the, the brands to understand what's important to them and what are the, the really real concerns that they have about how, you know, how they embrace this, this new world of adding technology to the products that they, they make. And I think for the most part, um, you know, they have very understandable questions. You know, there's, there's uh, like every industry, they have their own design cycles where they have their own financial kind of models that you have to work through. And, mm -hmm. um, so I think it's, it's been a great learning experience for us and a good experience for them too. And I think, you know, at least in the case of Mika, you know, we've had some success where, um, and, and I, you know, it's kind of funny to call this uh, success when you're coming from a, a tech background, but there are people who will wear it whether it's charged or not, mm -hmm. right? And to me that says you've made something that has intrinsic value as a, as a wearable object. And then the fact that it actually comes with this technology is a, is a wonderful addition to what it can do. That's actually a really good bar to sort of measure a wearable by. Mm -hmm. do, do people wear it when it's off? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so you've been in, you know, you have obviously got a great sense of aesthetics because you're constantly designing beautiful hardware. Uh, are, there, are there any I was going to say, I don't know that I would. <laughs> well, I, I don't think anybody here is necessarily fashion forward, uh, <laughs> since this is more of an engineering conference, but uh, is, there, uh, is there any sort of design rule of thumbs that you've learned over the years of what gets people excited about a, 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 an electronics object or a computer? Or... Wow, that's a, a great question. I mean, I do think um, if, if there's something I've learned at a number of the companies I've been at, and I've been very lucky to be at companies that they, they do take the not just the function, but also the appearance of the product very seriously, it's mm -hmm. that uh, attention to detail and execution is really critical. And it's, you know, as an engineer, I know that it's a lot easier to, there's a lot easier ways to do things, you know. 
but if you really can match the, the vision of the designer and, um, and do the things that I think, there are things that the consumer will appreciate as hard, and I think you know, we'll, we probably all have examples in our lives of products where we think they're just beautiful in the way that they come together. Mm. Fit and finish, material choices, the way that the, the uh, design was executed. Um, I, I think that that is even more important in the wearable space, unless we're talking about industrial wearables or some of the other ones that are you know, in the enterprise space and industrial, in the medical space, maybe these things aren't so critical. But if you're talking about consumer wearables, uh, I, I really do think that the quality of execution is, is critical to, to people really not just um, you know, being interested in the functionality, but being proud to be wearing them. Excellent. Uh, so obviously Intel has uh, a lot of vested interest in the, the wearables market and a lot of thought there, uh, but Intel also has a tremendous history of software expertise and you know, the compilers are just amazing still to this day. I'm wondering if there's anything in the software side that you maybe are considering offering for developers to make things easier for them along with this. So you mentioned some APIs you had. Yeah, I, I think um, I mean, Edison's a great example. We really are trying to uh, build upon the great work that's been done with Arduino, but, but obviously the Edison board has a lot more capability, so we need to give the tools to, edit, uh, to uh, entrepreneurs and designers and makers to take advantage of those additional capabilities. Uh, with Curie, uh, which is a new module that we're coming out with um, this, uh, this summer, and, and that one, um, again, the, the intent is to make it easy for people to build great things on this, uh, this platform. Uh, but there's other things we're doing that are more ecosystem-wide. For instance, we're part of the Open Interconnect Consortium. Mm. And, and that's really around uh, kind of solving the bigger ecosystem problems of um, you know, how do you get all these things to connect to each other. It's great that I have you know, 500 people making uh, devices around my home and that I wear on my body. But if they don't talk to each other and they don't use the same... Uh... <laughs> Hold on a sec. We'll let Siri yeah, finish. Yeah, this is... This is uh... All right. At least she's not commenting on our, on our discussion. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so, I mean, I think that you know, solving that problem is also important because I can't afford to have 500 applications on my phone to try and control all these things. Absolutely. So you know, we're trying to put in place the device discovery and um, you know, working with another, other major partners to, to ensure that these you know, security is in place and a lot of the things that are going to ensure interoperability and, and the uh, consistency between the, the devices that are going to make up the Internet of Things. Mm. Do you have any advice for people developing uh, the Internet of Things in this audience who maybe want to get involved in that process? Um, the, uh, yes, actually, it's, it's, you know, the intent is to open source the, the, um, the, the product or the, the platform and, uh, and also to have a um, certification process so people can get certified. So I really would encourage everybody to go and check out the Open Interconnect uh, Consortium, which rolls off the tongue, uh, <laughs> or OIC. And, uh, and contribute if you can, and certainly look at it and give your, your thoughts because it's a, I think it's an important effort. And you know, we, I think I've seen predictions anywhere from 50 billion devices to 212 billion devices by, by 2020. And if none of those things can, can actually work together, it's going to be a mess. Uh, so um, almost all the industrial designers and designers that I know uh, have some sort of fetish for something weird. Like Jonathan Ivey is like a watch fetishist, obviously, right? So uh, is there some sort of object, doesn't have to be electronic in any way, uh, that you admire for its beautiful simplicity of design? Wow, an object um, that I admire for its beautiful simplicity of design. You know, I, I actually really like instruments quite a bit. So um, That's a good metaphor. I mean, you just pick them up and go, right? Sometimes. I have grand piano is a beautiful machine. Um, I, of course, I've been playing the ukulele lately, so that's a lot of fun, and they have a lot of variation in form. And, uh, but when something is well made and well uh, considered in its, in its form, it's, it's very satisfying. So here's the real trick question for you. What aspects of the design of a musical instrument do you think could be applied to a wearable? Is it this the simplicity of immediately having the interface blowing through the horn and you get a sound out the other end? Uh, I think it's actually it's a, it's a great question because um, you know, you could probably point to some musical instruments that are very intuitive, mm -hmm. like a you know guitar. I think you can pretty quickly pick up kind of how it functions. And others that I, to me are still mystifying, like a saxophone, where I uh, I look at it and I'm not sure where to start. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that um, you know musical instruments are, are generally built to be held and to be in close proximity to the body, uh, with the exception of 
you know, drums and, and <laughs> pianos, perhaps. Um, and I think that there's something uh, about that in terms of you know, wearables should consider the human form, and especially as we start to move beyond some of the more traditional forms, um, I think there's a lot of opportunity, particularly around things like 3D printing and mm -hmm. other ways to more closely uh, 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 match the, the body of whoever the user is to, to create some personalization that's really going to be uh, make for a much uh, better acceptance. It's interesting you mentioned that the saxophone is an intimidating object because when you look at it, it's very complex, lots of buttons, right? Sort of like if you had an application with lots and lots of buttons. But at the same time, something like a piano is less hostile even though it has far more options, but they're just sort of presented in a very easy to understand manner. Yeah, I'm sure there's some products that we could mash those metaphors up with, but I'm, I'm not going to do that. Indeed. Uh, so to wrap it up here, I guess what I would ask, uh, since you are such an incredibly experienced uh, designer of uh, products in these markets, uh, what sort of advice would you offer the audience? I mean, if you're you know, doing the dad thing here for like a whole bunch, the next generation, although it's a very, very so age these... different generation. But <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I do think that there's, um, I think we're just scratching the surface of the applications for wearable products, I think, and IoT products. I think there's, the, there's a few obvious ones that people have really embraced. Um, but if I look at the Make It Wearable Challenge, I actually saw some things that I thought were very thought-provoking and very different than what has already been uh, considered or, or released into the world. And I should mention that there's a Make It Wearable Challenge for 2015. That will be starting off uh, in, the, in the fairly near future. And, you know, the prize money is pretty good. There's uh, the chance of getting mentored by, by some industry, uh, experienced industry experts, and, um, and it's a chance to, to take that idea that you have and, and try and move it forward in a meaningful way. So, um, of course, I should also encourage them to develop on Intel Edison. So. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you very much, Stephen. I think yeah. that's it. Thanks, Alex. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Stephen is willing.